first of all, St. Faustina's life in many ways was dull. It was average. It was ordinary. But is that surprising? No, because that's exactly the kind of person that Jesus always or God always works through. Today is the feast day of St. Faustina, and so we're all here to uh, learn about the message she wanted to give to the world and uh, through a new devotion. Well, anyway, welcome everyone. I'm Father Chris. I'm one of the priests here with the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and uh, it's an honor to have you all here. Myself, Father Mike Gately, and a couple of the other priests go around the country speaking on a regular basis about Divine Mercy and about St. Faustina. Now, I'm going to try to give you a two-hour talk on St. Faustina and a three-hour talk on Divine Mercy in 50 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to be like those chipmunks who talk 50, you know, 100 miles an hour, right, trying to get it all in. Now, I'll do my best to try to summarize some of these important things. So I apologize because obviously I won't be able to get to everything, but we're going to try to do our best to get as much as we can to give you an idea of what this special feast is about, who St. Faustina was, and more importantly, what is this message and devotion of divine mercy. So let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit down upon us to open our minds and open our hearts to receive the wisdom that you wish us to, to have and to carry out these works of mercy in our daily activities and to embrace this message that God you gave through St. Faustina, the Apostle of Divine Mercy. Through her intercession on this very special day, we ask for the graces which you gave her to distribute, and we ask all this through the intercession of Mary and all the saints and through the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today. We have, on a daily basis, we have regular devotional activities. Uh, in addition to the talk today, at 1 o'clock, we have adoration. At 1.30, we have the Rosary for Life. At 2 o'clock, we have the Holy Mass. At 3 o'clock, we have the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, followed by the blessing of all the religious articles that you might have, and a blessing with the relic, first-class relic of St. Faustina. It's her toe bone. Now that's a crazy Catholic thing, isn't it? You should see when non-Catholics come to the shrine and see us kissing St. Faustina's toe bone. They really never understand that, but it's a, it's a beautiful opportunity for you to get a blessing with the relic. Now, in between that, if you have an opportunity, you can also do a, a walk around the grounds. If you're unable to walk, we got golf carts that are running around. But you'll want to see a couple special places. First of all, our Stations of the Cross which are up on the hill on the other side of our, our monastery. This is a brand new life-size uh, Stations of the Cross. And what did Jesus tell St. Faustina to do every day at the 3 o'clock hour if she could? I hear pray the chaplain. No. He told her to walk the Stations of the Cross. He said if you can do the Stations of the Cross, try to do that. Then if you can't, step into a chapel. If you can't do that, then stop and meditate on my passion. Now, why do we pray the chapel at 3 o'clock? Because it's about his passion, the passion of our Lord, right? Okay, so now, what we also have and across the thing is, is on the other side of the property is our gift shop. If you would like to be able to see any, uh, uh, it's one of the largest Catholic gift shops uh, uh, in Massachusetts. You can pick up some things on St. Faustina or about Divine Mercy. We also have several shrines here. Right up over the hill over here is the Holy Family Shrine. You can light candles. Over at the Marian Helper Center, we have the Our Lady of Mercy uh, Oratory and Candle Shrine, where you can light candles. 
We have behind us in this building that we're at right now and down below the Shrine of the Holy Innocents, which is a memorial to lost children. If any of you have known someone, which you may have or yourself have experienced the tragic loss of uh, the death of a child. I just met a woman a couple days ago that lost a 24-year-old daughter in a car wreck. And, and so our heart and our prayers go out uh, to her, to her family, uh, and, and, and whatnot. So we, we have that shrine behind us. Now on the other side to the left and down the hill, it's a little bit of a, a walk down the hill, not far, is the Our Lady uh, of Lourdes Grotto. And there is a replica of Our Lady of Lords. There's a candle shrine down there as well. And um, you know, most people that I've talked to that have visited the shrine have, I've always asked them when they ever mentioned to us that they've had a miracle or that they've prayed and received a great miracle, I always ask them two questions. If you don't mind my asking, first of all, what did you pray? And secondly, where did you pray it? And almost always, it's really interesting, Almost always they tell me at Our Lady of Lourdes Grotto. So there's something going on there, okay? And I think it's called the Blessed Mother, right? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, that's one other place for you to stop. So there's just many places that you can go and be part of uh, this special day today. Okay, so let's get started. Now, usually we do a talk just on Divine Mercy, but today being St. Faustina's Feast Day, I think it's important that we add a few more things. Now, first of all, St. Faustina's life in many ways was dull. It was average. It was ordinary. But is that surprising? No, because that's exactly the kind of person that Jesus always or God always works through, right? Even the apostles. You know, Jesus could have easily picked Herod or Caesar, right, to be the leader of the conversion of the, all the hearts of the world. But he doesn't do that. He picks people you wouldn't expect. He picked 12 apostles that didn't fit the mold. They were tax collectors and zealots and fishermen. And so what's interesting is the people that he picked were not your normal, like, well, today. Does God pick Hollywood movie stars most of the time? No. Does he pick great athletes? Sometimes, but then they get shunned, like Tim Tebow. And not very many Hollywood uh, stars get picked to do this kind of work. One of them comes to mind is Kirk Cameron. He was basically shunned right out of Hollywood. So God picks people you don't expect. And that's what he did with St. Faustina. And so we'll talk a little bit about her today. Now, she was, she grew up basically, here's the facts of her life. She was born in August 25th of 1905. And she was born Helena Kowalska to her two parents, Mariana and Stanislaus. Now she was the third of 10 children. She had five sisters and two brothers. And then two who died, there was 10 children total. And um, all the other sisters uh, who lived, um, she was the third one actually, and their life was difficult. They were raised on a farm, and on the farm they had a horse, a cow, a couple chickens and whatnot, but she left home early to help raise money and uh, keep the family going. And it was funny because Later, she also ran away from home to become a nun. We'll talk a little bit about that. But in a lot of ways, her life was dull. She never traveled more than about 400 miles from her home. Uh, she worked as a nanny and as a housekeeper. And she was extremely well respected amongst the people that she worked with because of her, her pleasant demeanor, always smiling. Uh, she always had a great uh, and loving presence about her. Now, what was interesting was she was only known to have gone to two dances in her whole life. And one dance that she went to, she came home late. And you know what she said to her parents? I am so sorry. I have brought shame and humiliation to my family. And I will never do it again. Can you imagine hearing that from a kid today? <laughs> I mean, I, I point to myself. I used to go out when I was in high school, when I could finally drive, right, and so I was driving around, and I'd get home late, and I'd get mad at my mom and dad if they were still up, <laughs> because I felt like they were waiting for me. How sad is that? I chastised my parents for waiting up for me, because I didn't feel like that that was showing me any adult respect. How ridiculous. They loved me. They wanted to stay up just to make sure I got home okay, and I chastised them for that. 
I look back at that and I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. And, you know, St. Faustina got home late and she told her father how ashamed she was. And she would never do it again. She only went to one other dance that we know of in any of her records. And this was a dance when she was close to 19 years old. And she was there with one of her sisters and a friend. And our Lord appeared to her. And he appeared to her as the crucified Christ. Not as what we would expect sometimes as he's appeared like to Mar Margaret Mary, Alec Coke, or others. He appeared as Christ crucified. And he was there, bloodied, suffering, crucified. And does anybody know what Jesus said to St. Faustina that day? He said, how long are you going to make me wait? So she took that to mean right away to she was to join a convent. Now, here's what's interesting. Her parents didn't want her to join a convent. You know why? Because in those days, you needed a dowry. What's a dowry? It's where the people had to pay money, right, to the convent to be able to pay for the expense of the sister. Now, her parents didn't want her to join the convent because she would have to pay a dowry. And they'd have to sell their only cow. They only had one cow left because at the time it was Soviet-occupied Poland and they had confiscated their horses and took all but one cow. So the one cow that they took, or didn't take, was one that they were afraid they'd have to give up for a dowry. So the parents didn't want her to become a nun. It's kind of funny because I'm the same way. When, uh, when I announced to my family that I was going to come to the Marians because I felt called to the priesthood, my mom cried for three days and said, grandchildren, I want grandchildren. I said, mom, you're gonna get a million of them now. And my dad got so angry because he said, you're walking away from a million dollar business. I started a business down in Charlotte. He said, you're a fool. And then at my family dinner, I announced to my family that I was gonna be entering into seminary. And my 82 year old aunt, Aunt Helen, God bless her, I said, I'm gonna become a priest. And she goes, are you gay? <laughs> and I said, no, Aunt Helen, you've met Gina, you've met Julie, you've met Jill. Why would you ask that question? So it, it, it really is understandable that even Faustina faced these difficult times, right? And people not understanding why she wanted to do what she needed to do. So St. Faustina took this message from Jesus that how much longer are you going to make me wait and she got out of packed her bag and got the next bus to Warsaw the next morning it was an 85 mile trip now she didn't know anybody she didn't know anybody she didn't know anybody from Adam but she took it upon herself to do this you know what she did when she got there now okay if you're like me sadly I have to admit this and probably a lot of you are the same way when she got there Instead of doing what I would have done, which would have went around trying to ask directions, try to get food, try to understand the people there, try to find out where everything is, she didn't worry about any of that. The first thing she did was look for a church to go to Mass. And I look at that and I say, wow, that, there's your heart. That's what's important, right? And so she did, and she went, she went to Mass at St. James in Warsaw, which I got to go to last year. Then, this is the funny part. She started going around convent to convent, knocking on doors, asking if they would take her. And everybody told her, no. They said, we don't serve maids here. So even the sisters had a little bit of pride, right? Because see, she was a maid. She was torn and taggered to her, her clothes. In fact, when she was growing up, uh, all the sisters that she had had to share only one dress. They only had one dress with which to share all the sisters to go to Mass. So St. Faustina only got to go to Mass every five weeks because they would share and rotate the dress. Isn't that amazing? Now today, people don't even care what they wear to Mass. And they don't care. And, and most would be happy that they could get out of Mass, right? Because I don't have a dress to wear. St. Faustina was devastated that she couldn't go to mass because they didn't have a dress. So they had one dress for the whole family. And so she would wear, uh, this one dress was the only time she could wear every five weeks because she rotated it with her sisters. 
Then when she would go to school, at school, the kids didn't even want to sit next to her because she was in such extreme poverty that she was ragged and tattered and, and kids would make fun of her. And, and, and so, you know, you can see from the very beginnings, her humbleness, having to experience that, being rejected from the very beginning, uh, that nobody wanted to be friends with her because she was in such poverty, you know, probably wasn't always bathed or, or, or wearing clothes that were decent, um, you know, and this is what she experienced. So now she's going door to door, asking uh, the convents to take her, and all said no, and then she comes to, you guessed it, the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy. Now that's so perfect, like us, we're the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, spreading the message of Divine Mercy. You can't separate them. Mary and Divine Mercy go together. They can't be separated. What's God's single greatest act of mercy ever bestowed upon a human being? The Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception is God's greatest act of mercy ever bestowed upon a creature. And so she went around, she goes to the door at the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy, and the Mother Superior answers the door. And she says, okay, she's just trying to brush her off. I will let you come in for trial if you can pay for your habit. They have beautiful habits. You've ever seen the habits of St. Faustine? You see it behind me? You always see these sisters, and we, uh, do you know Mother, uh, or excuse me, Sister Faustina? They're sisters of Our Lady of Mercy in Boston. And so she has a community, sisters here, a community in Boston. And um, I used to go out there a couple times, and, and you'd always recognize them as soon as you saw them. And then we had a couple of them here for Divine Mercy Sunday, and you'd see them from a mile away. There's beautiful habits. Well, anyway, the Mother Superior tells her, if you get enough money to raise for the habit, I'll let you in. So St. Faustina goes about and goes back to work as a nanny and a housekeeper to raise the money to pay for her habit. So after she raised the money, she came back and knocked on the convent door. The Mother Superior didn't even remember she didn't even know who she was. And St. Faustina said, remember me? She's like, huh? And she's like, you promised that I would be able to come if I raised the money for the habit, and here it is. So the mother honored her word and let her in. Now, that was just the beginning of the tough, tough times for St. Faustina. So you see, when she was little, she used to acknowledge the fact that she would have mystical experiences. Her first mystical experience was at age seven in adoration. And her mother told her it was nonsense. And so she really didn't talk about it much after that. And when she got to the convent, she started to talk a little bit about it again. And the sisters shut her down. How would Jesus appear to a lower level nun like you? See, they had two choirs of nuns in the convent. They had the higher choir and the lower choir. And it was all based on wealth and education. So these are things we don't really realize. So St. Faustina fell into the lower choir. She got all the tough jobs and duties, right? She was assigned as a porter, portress to open the door, a cook to cook the meals, gardener to take care of the garden. Now she was really good at gardening because she grew up right on a farm. Do you know what her job was on the farm? Her job was a dirt clod breaker upper. <laughs> her job when she was on the farm as a little girl, she would break up dirt clods in her hand to make plowing and the planting easier. She started when she was barely able to walk, I guess, because she was real little. It reminds me of my mom. She comes from a European family and my mom said the earliest memory she has of her whole life was out hoeing tomatoes in Toledo, Ohio. And so we, we see in St. Faustina that same humble beginning. So the nuns put her to work as a gardener, like I said, as a cook and as a portress. And she started to talk about Jesus and she kind of gave some alluding to the fact that Jesus was appearing and she had some of these experiences and she was shunned. So she basically stopped really talking about it. Now what's interesting though is Jesus was with her the whole way, even though he hadn't appeared to her yet. 
And uh, finally then, one day in uh, February of 1931, she has the first, we would call it, we could, could call it an apparition or a vision, but I wouldn't call it that. And here's why. You know, most of the people who have experienced um, Christ or Mary or whatnot, it's an internal vision, right? Nobody else sees it. Like the mission or the visionaries at Fatima, right? Three children. But did anybody else other than them see Mary? No. Medjugorje, you got the visionaries there. Does anybody else see Mary except the visionaries? No. What happened with St. Faustina? She goes back into her cell. Could you imagine this? You finish dinner, you're going down the hall, you walk into your room, you close the door, you turn around, and there's Jesus. And he was not a vision. He was actually physically there. And he appeared to her as, well, I'm sorry, right above us, as the image of divine mercy with the rays of red and light. Now, other people saw the bright lights. You know, in fact, many people reported seeing the bright lights coming from Faustina's room. This wasn't an internal vision. He was actually physically there. Now, little kids down, uh, down below came to the door and said that it was like an airplane light. Other sisters reported that the super bright light was coming from Faustina's room, like brighter than any oil lamp. And so people realized that something was going on. Now, what did Jesus tell St. Faustina when he appeared to her? Jesus told her that I want this image painted of the pattern that you see before me. What is that pattern? Well, you see it right up here. It's Jesus, the divine mercy. Now, he also told her, I want a feast, a feast in honor of my mercy. Now... Then he tells her, you are responsible for spreading this around the world. Could you imagine? I mean, let's face it. You're a little farmer coming from Nowheresville in Poland. And in fact, John Paul II said this. It was precisely to this poor girl, a girl from nowhere, that God entrusted the mission of announcing to the whole world the most important message of the 20th century. So this is basically what he told her. He said, you are responsible for spreading this around the world. I would have been like, Lord, are you serious? How in the world? But did he not do this with 12 apostles? He did it. He did it back then when there was no communication whatsoever. At least by the time of Faustina, you had radio and you had other, you had mass media, you had printing press. You had these things that the apostles didn't have. So our Lord is working with her as his tool. Now this daunting task that was given to her was something that he called her my apostle of divine mercy. And so basically she was in task, entrusted with spreading this message around the whole world. Now what is this? Now... Here's we're going to get into a little bit of an explanation. Now, divine mercy is interesting because a lot of people don't really necessarily refer when they say divine mercy to the same thing. If I say to you, what is divine mercy, what would you say? Some people would say, it's being nice to other people. Okay. Some other people would say, it's doing good deeds. Okay. Some people would say it's the devotion, praying the chaplet, and it's a bunch of prayers begging God for his mercy on us. Okay. Other people would say it's the message of the gospel. That's true. But what is divine mercy? It's Christ himself. This is why we say the devotion to the divine mercy. It's devotion to Christ. 
This is why when the priest says, and we've, we've talked to a lot of priests, and a priest says, we don't need another devotion. We already have a devotion to St. Therese. We already have a devotion to St. Joseph. We already have a devotion to uh, St. Anthony. What they're not understanding is this is not just another devotion. This is devotion to Christ himself. This is why it makes it different than all the other saint devotions, which are still good. They're still necessary. They're still wonderful and very important. But the divine mercy is Christ himself, God incarnate. So when we say the devotion to the divine mercy, we're saying devotion to God. Does that sound optional? Okay, now here's how it boils down. When somebody asks you, is divine mercy optional? Your answer is yes and no. Here's why. It is true that in the Catholic Church, devotions that come from private revelation have always been optional. So, for instance, do you necessarily have to pray the chaplet of divine mercy in order to get to heaven? Not technically. We strongly suggest you do because that's a way God gave us to attain salvation. Now here's where it all comes together. You see, divine mercy is different than almost all the others. Because divine mercy is not just a devotion. Divine mercy is both a message and a devotion. Now, if you're going to only get one thing out of today with you home, take this. Divine mercy, the message of divine mercy, is the heart of the gospel. Pope Benedict XV said, the message of divine mercy is the nucleus of the gospel. The message of divine mercy is easy to remember as A, B, C. A, ask for God's mercy. We cannot get to heaven unless we repent and ask of God's mercy. B, be merciful to others. Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. What does Jesus say? He says, at the end of time, you will all be separated into two groups. On the right will be the sheep. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Enter into the kingdom of your heavenly Father. To this side, sorry guys, the sheep or the goats, he says, when I was hungry, you did not give me food. When I was thirsty, you did not give me drink or naked clothe me. And they said, Lord, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, or naked? And he said, what you did not do for the least of my brethren, you did not do for me. Away with you into the fire, the eternal fire. You see, without being merciful to others, we can't make it to heaven. Jesus tells us that if we love God but not our neighbor, we are a liar. We have to love our neighbor. To the Jews, this was radical because who were the neighbors to the Jews? Only other Jews. They weren't the Sumerians or the Canaanites or the Babylonians or the Assyrians. Those weren't their neighbors. Those were their enemies. So that's why Jesus told them, love your enemies. And in this year of mercy, which Pope Francis has declared, what is the biggest message? Forgiveness and love of your enemy. It's very difficult for us to do that. But Jesus told St. Faustina, we most resemble him when we forgive. When we forgive is when we most resemble Christ. So Jesus is telling this to St. Faustina. So we must be merciful to others. What is C? Completely trust in God's mercy. Now we didn't trust a lot of times in God when we try to do things our own way. When we know better, right? My own sister, she struggled so much in her marriage with contraception. 
She said, I don't get this. This doesn't make any sense. This is outdated. This is impractical. I'm not following it. I said, Pam, have you ever read Humanae Vitae? It was really a little too deep for her. She's not a very theological person. But when we sat down and talked over it together, she finally got it. And she says, you know what? I realize the church of 2,000 years knows better than I do. And she did. She understood it. So you see, completely trusting in God, as a seventh grader once told me, is knowing that God is God and you are not. Right? Okay. So completely trust. Now, the message of divine mercy that I just told you, ABC, this isn't optional. This is mandatory. And it goes back to the very beginning, Adam and Eve. What did Adam and Eve do that was such a problem? They sinned, right? Yeah. But that was only the beginning of their problems. That wasn't the main problem. The problem of Adam and Eve was after they sinned. They never asked for God's mercy. They weren't merciful to each other. In fact, Adam blames the woman. Sound familiar? Right? It's his fault. My mom does this all the time. My dad does it all the time. In fact, I laugh. I don't laugh because it's precious. But in the confessional, a lot of times I'll have the, the little old ladies come in and they'll confess all their husband's sins. <laughs> I'm like, ma'am, now this is wonderful you're here, but this isn't your husband's confession. This is your confession. Okay? And then they'll, okay, Father, you're right, you're right. And then they'll say a few things and then they're right back on their husband again. <laughs> So, so Adam and Eve, they missed the boat. They were blaming each other. Adam said, it's the woman you gave me. And then what about C? They didn't trust God. What did they do? They ran and they hid. They ran and they hid. So instead of trusting, they ran and hid. This is why God gives us Mary. You know, Father Mike Gately did one of the most incredible talks I ever heard when we were in the car driving to Boston. I was the sole audience. I said, Mike, that is the greatest talk I have ever heard you give and you wasted it on me. And he talked about this. He said, you know, this is why God gave us Mary. He realized that we were going to fear him. We weren't going to trust him. What do we do when we get ourselves in trouble? We, we, Mary is one of us in some ways. Better than us in most other ways. But she's a human. She's a creature. And we can trust her a little bit more. And that little, little bit of a trust will lead us to a greater trust in God. You know, most of us went to our mother when we were little. I'll never forget, my dad got this brand new Eagle Claw fishing pole. And I just saw that thing, and I, oh, that was, it was over. I had to try that fishing rod, and we lived on a river. So my dad says, nope, you got your fishing rod, this one is mine. He was trying to teach me a lesson. Of course, it didn't work. <laughs> Because as soon as he went off to work and my mom went shopping, I grabbed that rod and I was so excited to be able to go fishing that I grabbed the rod and I grabbed the lures and I was all excited and the rod was over my shoulder and I ran through the door and closed the door. <laughs> Snap went the fishing rod. I tried to tape it up. <laughs> Thinking he'd never notice. <laughs> thinking that he would just think, well, that's a piece of tape left on from the manufacturer. I will bother to take it off. I'll leave it on there. And he got home, and I did the same thing with his pool stick also, too. So I, I, you'd think I'd learn my lesson. And the first thing is I did, I ran to my mom. Mom, please don't let Dad get mad at me. Please don't let Dad get mad at me. The dog broke it, right? No, no, I was smart enough to admit that I broke it. But I went to my mom. 
And she was the gift that Jesus gave us on the cross, right? And so we have this, and C is completely trust in God. And we don't do it. But Mary was a gift for us to turn to. She's one of us. We can trust her a little bit. And then she leads us to Jesus, to Jesus through Mary. That's what the Marian consecration is all about. That's what the Marian missionaries are out spreading as they work with the homeless and the poor. And so it's so beautiful of taking that message to the street. So they're asking God to be merciful to them. They're being merciful to others as they go out and work with the poor and the homeless. And then they're trusting in God. Now, when somebody says, is divine mercy optional? You say yes and no. The divine mercy is both a message and a devotion. I just explained the message. It's the heart of the gospel. It's ABC. Now, what was the problem with Adam and Eve? I just said they didn't know their ABCs. <laughs> Adam and Eve did not know their ABCs. They failed. That was the problem. So God has been trying since day one to get us to understand those three things. Those are the heart of the gospel. Those three things. Ask for God's mercy. Be merciful to others. Completely trust in God. He's been trying to drill this in our heads from the very beginning. He's brought us the prophets. He's brought us all of the gospels and the scripture and finally his son. It's like the parable of the man with the, uh, the vineyard, right? He finally says, I'll finally send my son. And this is what we're trying to understand. This is the message of mercy. It is not optional. The message of divine mercy is not optional. But wait a minute. Private revelation is optional. This is the devotion of divine mercy. The devotion to the divine mercy. These are five new ways that Jesus gave St. Faustina with which to bring the same message of mercy back to the world. So the message of mercy has always been there, ABC. But the world has forgotten it. So Jesus said to St. Faustina, I'm giving you these new channels of grace. These five new channels with which to bring my message of mercy back to the world. The message of mercy isn't optional. So Jesus gave five new ways to bring the message to the world again. And that is the devotion of the divine mercy. You can remember this as easy as finch. The finch, like the little bird, F-I-N-C-H. What is F? The feast of divine mercy, right? I is the image of divine mercy, right? C is the chaplet of divine mercy. No, did I forget N? N is the novena. But I can't even spell. <laughs> N is the novena of divine mercy. C is the chaplet of divine mercy. And H is the hour of divine mercy, which is when? What time? Three o'clock every day, right? Father Mike makes a good... Yes. Three o'clock. Father Mike also makes a great point that every day is like a mini Divine Mercy Sunday between 3 and 4 o'clock. It's a little mini hour of mercy, right? And this is what's so important. So now, Jesus gives these five new devotional aspects with which to bring the same message back to the world. Now, technically, the devotion to Divine Mercy was given through private revelation and technically is optional. But why is it important then? Why is the feast of divine mercy important, the image of divine mercy important, the novena of divine mercy important, the chaplet, and the hour of mercy? Why are all these things important if they are, in technical terms, optional? They're important because the devotion of divine mercy helps us to a deeper living of the message of divine mercy. Right? Does everybody understand that? That is so, so important. So in the Feast of Divine Mercy, I don't have time to explain all these, and I uh, give talks on each of these elements, but we'll just kind of summarize everything. The F is the important, very important, because the Feast of Divine Mercy is one. When is the Feast of Divine Mercy? 
Sunday after Easter, right? Now, Jesus told St. Faustina that it has to be on that day. Why does the Feast of Divine Mercy have to be on the Sunday after Easter? Anybody? You can get a four-year seminary degree if you can answer this one, right? Okay. Now, it's important. There's extreme significance. Now, in the church, since going back to our Jewish roots, we have always celebrated feasts. Now, the feast, the Jewish celebration of a feast, they have levels, right? They have levels of the feast. Now, within the levels, the most and the biggest feasts were so big, they couldn't celebrate them in one day. They would celebrate them over eight days, and they would be called an octave. Now, an octave means eight, and this is when you would have the big Jewish celebration, over eight days, and they were all celebrated as if it were one day, kind of like a wedding feast. They would celebrate over multiple days. Now, in the church, we still have octaves. Do you know that there's an octave of Christmas? Right? Did you all know that? What is the octave of Christmas? It's eight days, right? And it starts on December 25th. That's the first day, right? The 25th. The 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st. The first. What big feast is on January 1st? The feast of a happy new year. No, just kidding. Just kidding. This is what everybody thinks it is. I grew up in, through my college years thinking we went to Mass on January 1st if you could get up and, and not been an idiot the night before to go to church and pray for a happy new year. This is sadly what most Catholics believe. It has nothing to do with it. I mean, of course, we should pray for a happy new year, blessings upon our nation, which, by the way, please pray for our nation, right? You know, um, you know Jesus uh, told St. Faustina that, um, you know, she had to pray for, for her country. And, uh, and we got to pray for our country. And, you know, there was uh, an account in the diary that an angel was going to strike at one of the cities in Poland. And he was going to strike and bring chastisement, great chastisement upon a major city in Poland. We believe from the writings, you see this picture over here of this priest? This priest is Blessed Michael Sapochko. This is the confessor of St. Faustina. Very important man. And in fact, when St. Faustina suffered, Jesus told her, you're only bearing a portion of the sufferings of this priest. Can you imagine? How much she suffered and she was only bearing a portion of the punishments of that priest? That's phenomenal. How much that man bore on his shoulders. That's him. Well, anyway, we know from his writings, or we shouldn't say we know, we believe from his writings that that angel was going to strike that city in Poland for abortion. That particular city in Poland was one of the European capitals for abortion. And this angel was coming down to strike. And St. Faustina fervently prayed the chaplet of divine mercy. And she kept praying it and praying it. And guess what happened? The angel was rendered helpless. He couldn't carry out the chastisement that was coming to that city in Poland. Now, I think of our nation. We've legalized abortion for over 40 years. And how or who are we to think that we don't believe that same chastisement is coming? I personally believe because the Lord's mercy is so great. And so many times, God bless these mothers. They're just confused. They're hurt. They're scared. They don't know what to do. They need our love, they need our embracing, and they need our prayers. And I think that these chaplets that we're offering up, every day we pray the rosary for life. I honestly believe that one of the reasons God has been so merciful and hasn't done that is because of the prayers that come out of that 
trying every single day. Every single day, there are hundreds of people in that shrine praying the rosary for life and an end to abortion. And I believe that that is why Jesus has been so merciful. I don't know, but that's one of the things I believe. So anyway, Jesus told Faustina to pray for a country, so please pray for our country. Well, anyway, this chastisement never came that particular moment because of her prayers at the chaplet. But anyway, in this octave that we have is eight days of prayer, eight days of celebration of one feast. Now, the feast that we celebrate on January 1st is Mary, the mother of God, right? Now, why do we celebrate that feast? That feast is so important because Mary bookends the great feast of the incarnation. The Christmas is the feast of the incarnation and then eight days later we celebrate Mary. You can't separate. All eight days are celebrated as one. They're two of the most important feasts in the church. You have on Easter, uh, on Christmas, the incarnation and on January 1st, Mary, the mother of God. This is why we can celebrate that as one feast. You can't separate them. We have one other octave in the church left today that we actively celebrate. There used to be many more, Pentecost and others. But we still celebrate one other octave. It's the biggest octave in the church. What is it? Easter. Easter. Now, what does the octave of Easter begin? Easter Sunday, right? Day one. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the eighth day. It's the bookend of the most important time of the year. This puts the feast of divine mercy on a whole nother level. And Jesus told St. Faustina, it must be on the eighth day. Now let's look at this for a minute. Why would Jesus say that? Because you see, on Easter Sunday, Jesus opened the door to heaven. Now... Why wouldn't we celebrate the feast over seven days? What's the perfect number in the Bible? Seven. But what does seven represent in the Bible? Time. Creation. Right? In the Jewish tradition, eight represented eternity. Eternity. So you see, on Easter Sunday, Jesus opened the door to heaven and redeemed all of mankind. Yes or no? Was all of mankind redeemed at the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yes. yes. Will all of mankind be saved? No. Because you see, on Easter Sunday, Jesus opened the door to heaven. The next seven days are symbolic of what? Our pilgrimage here on earth. Time. Creation. On the next seven days, you're wandering in the desert looking for that door. Don't forget to grab Mary. She's the ultimate GPS. She will lead you. Lead you home. Then on the eighth day, you go into heaven for all eternity. This is what's so beautiful, but... What do you have to do before you enter heaven? You have to be cleansed and spotless. When you have the feast of divine mercy, Jesus Christ gives us the promise that on this feast day, all sin and all punishment due to sin are wiped away. As long as you have some rectification of the will. You see, on, when you go to confession normally, you're forgiven of sin, right? Right? As long as you have a valid confession. But are you forgiven of the punishment? The eternal punishment you are, hell. But temporal punishment, purgatory, probably remains. Unless you have perfect contrition, perfect, perfect contrition. It probably remains. But you can't get into heaven if you have any stain of sin or punishment. So on Divine Mercy Sunday, Jesus offers us something special. All sin and all punishment is wiped away. All of it. So that you're ready to enter into heaven. And what did every Jewish man want his bride to be before they entered into heaven? 
I'm sorry, before they got married. <laughs> what did every Jewish man want his bride to be before he took her home to meet his father? Spotless. Every Jewish man wanted his bride to be spotless when he took her home to meet his father. Now Jesus is the groom. We are the bride. And in the mass, he's taking you home. It's through the mass that he's taking you home to meet the father at the end of time. It is, mass is outside of time, so in, through the mass we go home, Christ brings us back to the father. That's what our whole faith is based on. It's a circle called Exitus Reditus, Thomas Aquinas. It all comes from God, all will return to God. All came from God, creation, the first great act of mercy. We fell, we got broken. Jesus came, redeemed us, the second great act of mercy by the second person of the Trinity. Creation was the first great act by the first person of the Trinity. We fell, got broken. Redemption was the second great act of mercy by the second person of the Trinity. Then, by the power of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, all of creation will be reconciled back to the Father for all creation, for all time, will be reconciled back for all eternity. This will be on the eighth day. And we need to be spotless. This is the meaning of the Mass. When you go to Mass, this is what's happening. You know, we tell our kids, when I have catechism, I tell them, I said, why did Jesus die on the cross? And they say, because he loves us. Yes, he could have loved you in heaven, though. Um, to forgive our sins. Yes, but he could have forgiven your sins in heaven. The reason Jesus died on the cross was all those but specifically because the penalty for sin is death. When you sin, when I sin, we deserve the death penalty. We deserve to die. We owe our life because of it, because it's such a heinous crime. It's a crime against God. So when we die, we're owed the death penalty. So I say to my seventh graders all the time, guys, what happens if you commit a crime? You're old enough to understand this. They said, you get arrested. Yeah, then what? You go to jail. No, you forgot something. You go before the judge. And what happens when you go before the judge? The judge says, you're guilty of the worst crime. Sin is the worst crime. We all are going to be for that judge. All of us. And that judge has the right to say to every one of us, you're guilty of the worst crime possible. Sin, the crime against God, me, the Father. And then the judge, the father, says, your penalty is death. Right? Wrong. Because in through the back door comes a man in a beard and a robe and sandals. And he says, your honor, I will pay this person's debt. I will pay their debt. And the judge says, the honor, your honor says, okay, you will pay this debt. And the man in the robe and the hair, long hair and the beard says, yes. But the judge looks at you and he says, do you accept this? And you say, yes or no. You'd be out of your right mind if you didn't say yes. This is why the Protestants have it right. I accept Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. They have it right. Now the judge says one more thing before he lets you go. In order to work out the details, we all got to come back here and meet on Sunday morning at 8, 10, or 12. What happens Sunday morning at 8, 10, or 12? The Mass. Because when you are at Mass is when this debt is being paid. Who in their right mind wouldn't come back if Jesus Christ is going to pay your debt at that moment in time and you're free to go? Ah, oh, nah, 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 nah. You got a football game to go to. Or if you're in Fargo, a hockey game to go to, right? So we do this. We're guilty of this. But we're not understanding the important message. The important message is it's there at the Mass that your debt's being paid. When you go to Mass, you're outside of time. When you go to Mass, the, uh, Benedict says in the spirit of the liturgy, the roof of the church opens up. And heaven and earth connect and the angels descend. And time, our time, tick-tock, historical time, ends. It doesn't matter anymore. God is outside of time, sacred time. And in sacred time, there's no past, there's no future. It's all one big eternal now. So you at Mass are at the foot of Calvary. You are there at the foot of Calvary. You're not re-crucifying Christ. This is why the Protestants, God bless them, 
But they say to us all the time, why do you keep re-crucifying Christ? We don't. You're there at the foot of Calvary. You're there present at the crucifixion. We live in time. God doesn't. He puts you outside of time when you go to Mass. You're transported to the foot of Calvary. You're there as Christ is paying your debt, as he's being nailed to the cross. That's when the priest lifts up the host. Now, who are the prayers in the Mass addressed to? The Father. They're not addressed to Jesus. They're addressed to the Father because the prayer is Christ's sacrifice. He's being sacrificed back to the Father. This is the circle. We all came from God in creation. Then he redeemed us and the cross. Now he wants to bring us back to God the Father. This is what's happening at the Mass. At the Mass, Christ is being sacrificed. And the prayers of the Mass say, Eternal Father, accept the sacrifice. So we are there. Don't miss the boat. Jesus is going back to the Father and he's begging you to grab on. Go with him. This is the Mass. So the Mass culminates all of this. And on the Feast of Divine Mercy Sunday, we're ready to enter heaven. We're there. We're part of it. When did John Paul II die? Everybody says he died the night before Divine Mercy Sunday. Do you all know in the liturgical calendar, the day starts, the feast starts the night before. Cardinal Jeevich, who I met a couple months ago, said that when John Paul II was very ill in the last day of his life, they had already celebrated Saturday Mass. And he had already celebrated Mass for that Saturday. And he had been to confession. And he was feeling very weak. And Cardinal Jeevich was his right-hand man for 40 years. And Cardinal Jeevich said he got this inspiration in his heart to celebrate Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday. Because now it was after 5 o'clock. Right? Because after 5 o'clock on a Saturday, you're celebrating the Sunday Mass. So it was like 5.30, he said. And he got in his heart to celebrate the Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday. He ignored it. About an hour later, the, his heart said it again, celebrate Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday. Again, he ignored it. A third time. Does that sound familiar? Like Peter, right? A third time. And he said, that's it. Can you imagine the cardinals rummaging around the sacristy, looking for the key, grabbing the chalice, getting the purificator, finding the pall, getting the host, pouring the wine, getting the elves, getting the book, setting the missile, getting the lectionary, looking at the readings. He did all of this because something was on his heart to celebrate the Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday, which John Paul II wasn't going to do to the next day. He had already celebrated Mass that morning for Saturday. It was not the Divine Mercy Sunday Mass. But now that it's after 5 o'clock, he could celebrate the Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday. And this kept on his heart. Do it. Celebrate it. Celebrate it. He ignored it. He ignored it. Finally, he gave in. He set up a celebrated Mass. It was 9 o'clock at night. Unheard of for them to do this. He set up the Mass, John Paul II, received Holy Communion. He had been to confession. What are the two requirements Jesus asked us to do on Divine Mercy Sunday? Go to confession. If you can, it doesn't have to be on that day. It can be a couple days before as long as you're in a state of grace. And receive Holy Communion. And if you have rectification of the will and you ask for that grace, everything is cleansed. Everything is given up. Everything is wiped clean. It's like a second baptism. And John Paul II received Holy Communion and died 28 minutes later. 25, 28, 30 minutes later. He received that grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. Coincidence? I don't think so. Grace, absolutely. A grace that God rewarded him with for spreading this message and devotion around the world and dedicating his pontificate to it. You know, one of our priests overheard John Paul II say on the day of St. Faustina's canonization in 2000, the first saint canonized in 2000, John Paul II said, this is the happiest day of my life. So if that doesn't tell you the importance of this feast and the importance of this message, nothing will. 
So God bless you all. Thank you so very much. We're so very grateful that you could join us. Thank you. Thank you very much.